The Warhammer hobby is an interesting one. It's very, very young as far as hobbies go, but it has quite a history to it. Many models have been through a bunch of different iterations over the years, and I really appreciate the history that old models carry. Over the course of Warhammer, both Fantasy and 40k, models have gone from oddly lumpy lead caricatures of Judge Dredd ripoffs to pretty sweet pewter grimdark warriors. Then crispy plastic Build-A-Bear style army men to sweet digitally perfected gaming pieces that are display quality. And really all this happened pretty quick. Anyhow, really this is just a long-winded way of saying that recently I got a very heavy model in the mail. And I'm really excited about it. Hey guys, Jay here. Welcome to Eons of Battle. I don't really know how it happened, but I really get a kick out of old models. When I saw this adorable lump of lead on eBay, I snatched it up without a second thought. I didn't even have a plan for what I was going to do with it, but just look at him. Can you honestly say that you could resist that smile, that rockin' bot, or those big watery eyes? Don't lie to me. I know you would happily make him a member of your mini family. And I think I have the perfect solution on how to make him a member of mine. I have recently begun a small force of Chaos Space Marine Death Guard, and I love them. This army of sticky slimy space marines should give me all the excuses I need to put together and paint up this beast of Nurgle. And I certainly have precedent for including old school models in my modern armies. It's something I did even without really noticing. In my super snazzy Gene Stealer cult army, I have this shifty looking metal magus running around, casting spells and commanding troops to spring from the shadows and begin the cult takeover. In my Black Templar Space Marine Crusade, my bikers are led by a Rogue Trader era chaplain on bike. That might just be one of my favorite paint jobs ever. And my Necrons are mostly new, but eagle-eyed observers will spot that my Scarab Swarm bases are made up of piles of bugs from the Indominus box, early 2010s, and Rogue Trader. By the way, I have videos on all these models, and you can watch them here, after you finish with this video of course, and you can find them linked in the description below. So this Beast of Nurgle will be in good company in my collection. So I don't want to waste any time, I've been sitting on this model for like two weeks and I am dying to get to work on him. So it's time to sit down with my brushes and tools and get him painted. And along the way I'll talk about the history of this model and what I plan to do with it in my army. It wouldn't be an EOB video without taking a crack at some cool basing. Everything in Warhammer has gotten a lot bigger over the years, and this guy was originally supplied with the old rectangular cavalry base, but I think this 50mm round base is going to be much more age appropriate. First I broke out my cutting mat, and then prepared to pick out a rock for him to sit on. I looked through my bag of pine nuggets until I found one that was a good fit. Once I found my Plague Boys glass slipper, I took a piece of 60 grit sandpaper and smoothed the bottom flat so it stuck down better to my base. I cleaned off the sanding dust and then applied some hot glue. There is no better glue for bonding wood to plastic. Next I added some nice muddy texture by using mud, Vallejo mud texture. I applied a thin layer of this all over the exposed base. When using this stuff, a few small layers will dry much faster and better than one big fat one. Now I really want to add some skulls to this base, and if I could put on my Games Workshop shill hat for just a second. I really like the Citadel Skulls box. It comes with like 400 plastic skulls, and the really nice thing about being made of plastic is you can use plastic glue to attach them so you can get a much better bond. But for this project, I'm pretty sure I can get away with my Green Stuff World Skulls. They're a little bit mushy in terms of detail, but they should work great in clumps on this base. I poured out my skulls and picked a few that I liked. Then I added more mud and then carefully picked up a skull and then pressed it into the goop. Then I put more mud in between the skulls so that they looked like they had been there a while and have begun to sink under the ground. Well, I suppose with the base done, it's now time to build this sucker. And in researching this model, it really led me down a whole bunch of rabbit holes. This model I'm working on was the first ever Beast of Nurgle released just over 30 years ago. And I suspect that this artwork was drawn after the model was sculpted, but I like to think that this was the most faithfully recreated model of all time. Look at that painting. It's basically a photograph of the metal model. According to the Lost Minis wiki, Citadel's first edition of the Beast of Nurgle was deemed too small, which is strange, as the original looks really good and is not that small. It seems that this little fella was only sold from 1990 to 1991 and was quickly replaced with the second edition Beast of Nurgle. 
This was the replacement, the second edition Beast of Nurgle, and this model lasted a lot longer than the original. And please leave a comment if you think that this was an improvement or not. In my opinion, it is a step in the wrong direction. The new one might look a little scarier than the first edition, but it doesn't have the same charm. This model was THE Beast of Nurgle for a while, but it was eventually replaced with a more grimdark version with the third edition Beast. This was when Warhammer was more finding its image, and this monster is much more John Carpenter's The Thing. And much less... This. That Twisted Metal Beast model was the sculpt all the way up until 2018 when it was replaced with the plastic kit. And this is the one that you can buy from Games Workshop web store right now. And it's no longer for Warhammer Fantasy Battles, but Age of Sigmar. I think this is one of those models that looks better in person, and as cool as Games Workshop's Nurgle sculpts are, I think they really come alive once they are out in the wild and people other than Games Workshop's Heavy Metal team are taking a crack at them. The Beast of Nurgle has had a surprising number of models for a unit that is not a rank and file troop or a hero or HQ, but something that has been inspiring designers for 31 years. When building models like this, there is always some sloppy connections, so I mixed myself up some green stuff which should help me get a better glue bond between the lumpy metal parts. To fix the awful seam running all the way around him, I took a tiny roll of green stuff and shoved it in the gap. I used a combination of my fingers, hobby knife, and silicone brush to crush the putty into the hole and scuff it up so that it looks seamless. Well, it's time to work on the top head tentacles, and uh, this stuff looks pretty rough. And hilariously, I was sent two back rows and one middle row. And considering that this is a 30-year-old model, I can't imagine I'm going to be able to get a hold of a proper piece. But I'm not too worried. I don't think it'll matter much anyway. This guy is pretty lumpy. I'm pretty sure I can make do. I carefully destroyed the resale value of this model by grinding away at the tabs, as not all three pieces would fit in the head together. I also widened the gap for the tentacles too. Basically, I ground away everything I could to give myself more room. I put some green stuff in the gap and then stuck on my first back layer of tentacles. The green stuff gives me more surface area for the glue to stick to. Then for the real back row, I did the same. A little green stuff and then lots of force to really squish it down. And then there was just enough room for the top tentacles to slide in the remaining space. For his little flippers, I super glued in a small ball of green stuff and then squished the metal into place. And there he is, a cute little fella. Well, he's on there and all of his parts are attached. <sighs> Hopefully they stay attached. And now I have to position his tentacles. And boy oh boy, are they long, spindly, delicate pieces of pewter. So I'm hoping a little bit of selective heat will help me get them into position. Uh, I hope so. Heat can definitely make metal a lot more pliable, but it might also make it more brittle. So, wish me luck. I blasted the models with a hairdryer on high heat for a while, and it did seem to do something. It certainly got things hot. I ever so gently pulled, bent, and twisted the long tentacles into position. And it was fun, but it was also super scary. If one broke off, it would be a huge pain in the butt to get it back on. Well, I got everything attached, and you know, I think the hairdryer did do something. A heat gun probably would have worked a little bit better, although the hairdryer did a good job of making the metal uncomfortable to work with, and my fingers feel a little singed. But, you know, it's all in the effort of getting him built, and he is now built. So, it is time to paint him. I prepared my surface for painting. This guy is too big and too heavy for my normal cubes of wood, so I found this piece of 2x4 and used two pieces of 3M double stick tape to keep him attached. Then it was time to prime. I gave him a coat of Steinol Res black primer through my airbrush, although a rattle can would have worked too. Then I put some white ink into my brush and sprayed this from a directly above in a Zenithal highlight. The Zenithal looks lovely, as it always does, and is a Zenithal an effective strategy to improve your mini painting? And the answer is a simple drum roll, please. It depends. If it's a model I've never painted before, like this guy, I find it super helpful if only to see the model from a new perspective to see my raised areas in a crisp white and my recesses in a dark black. I think it is super helpful to really understand the model and working up in small transparent layers, I find that I make smaller mistakes slower than if I just went right in with proper opaque paint, I make uh, large mistakes very fast. But if it's a model I painted a lot previously and I already kind of have a routine planned, I usually skip the Zenithal and go right for my normal strategy. But on a model like this, I think a Zenithal is a great step one. Looking at my little plague army, I paint my marines with mostly greens and blues and my poxwalkers with mostly pink. And I think my Beast of Nurgle will lean more Poxwalker than Plague Marine. 
For colors, I went with a green, an orangey brown, a yellow, a pink, a black wash, and a dark blue, and of course, like all projects, a generous dollop of white and black. I thinned my colors a lot so that I could take full advantage of my Zenithal, and I decided to first go with pink. I put this on his weird snail skirt ridges and on his tentacles, and his friendly smile. Next up, some super thin green. I just slapped this down wherever. There is a certain freedom with Nurgle models, you can be a little sloppy. After the green then came blue, which I continued applying by filling in more of the white prime parts, and I let my colors overlap so it all just added to the messy style. Then came yellow. This is the most different color, and I used plenty of water to blend it into the blues and greens. And last but not least, some watery orange brown. This blends really nicely with my other colors and creates some weird values and textures. So at this point, you're probably thinking, Jay, you've lost me. That looks like a muddled mess. And you're right, but it is right where I like my Death Guard to be. I just slap on all the colors and then take a look at it. And that's the great thing about painting is it's an additive process. And so if I go too much with something, I can put on more paint to bring it down. And if something's a little too subtle, I can add more paint to bring it up. Whereas something like woodworking, if I cut a table leg two inches too short, uh-oh, it's the whole project's ruined. But with painting, you can always fix it. And another thing I really find helpful with painting is knowing a little bit of the history and the lore of a miniature. And this guy has some really, really fun lore behind him. And let me talk about it while I wait for this guy to dry. The Beast of Nurgle, also known as the ga na Gairon by weirdos, and also known as the Slime Hounds of Nurgle or Nurgle's Lapdogs, are demons of Nurgle. The Beast has a soft, mushy, sticky body that is described like a slug, although the first edition was really the only time it really looked like a slug. It's just a walking, rolling, slithering, squirming pile of plague, but they are cute. In a way, Beasts of Nurgle exemplify the god Nurgle's endless enthusiasm and excitement for life and death. So even though these are horrible monsters that can kill you just by standing near you, they have the temperament of a puppy. All they want is to give you a lick, and that is the absolute last thing you want, because a lick is certain death. This guy is not John Carpenter's The Thing, it's Mac and Me. It's a friendly, fun-loving alien that, just like the alien Mac, you will do anything to keep it away from you. Let me demonstrate exactly how I take my base coat and finish it on his tail. I started with a dark color, in this case, my blue mixed with black, and then I exaggerated the shadows, the line between the ridges and tail and the inside of these little ruffles. Then I began mixing my pink with white paint and highlighting the pink ridges and I mixed some blues with whites and highlighted the weird hair things that make up his sluggy body. I highlighted with blue over the yellow areas to bring these patches together and make a gradient. I did the same with my yellow, mixing it with white and then using it to highlight the raised parts. I went back and forth with light blue, light green, light yellow, and light pink, bringing the raised portions of the model to be brighter and brighter. These highlights are going to be what makes it look like it was done on purpose and less like the sloppy base coat I started with. This was tricky, but one way to make it easier is to let the paint be a little thick and wipe away most of it until it's not flowing as much as being left behind when the bristles are dragged over details. Then I used watery colors to re-emphasize the base colors, and here I am working on a transition from green and blue to red and yellow. Lastly, I took some pure white paint and dotted this here and there to finish my value. This will make the model pop, as pure black and pure white are represented. I repeated the process across the whole sluggy body, and it was really fun. Well, I'm particularly happy with that sluggy body, and now, now I guess it's time to tackle that big ol' head of tentacles. Here we go! I want his tentacles to match the tentacles on my poxwalkers, so that means pink. But it's not a complete waste, I had to see them in green so that I could know what I didn't want. But you know what I always want to do? That's right, our Patreon! If you like the videos we make and you want more, the best way to support us is by becoming a member of our Patreon. Over there, you'll gain access to some behind the scenes, voting on models I paint live here on YouTube, a live hobby hangout every week, some terrain STLs, and more. With that said, let's get those tentacles sorted out. I rebase coated them all with pink. Then I watered down my red brown and mixed it with water and spread this over top of the tentacles. This shades them with a brown so that the tentacles are nice and separated. Then I mixed pink with white and highlighted everything. I let this be a looser highlight than I might do on a more modern model because the details just are softer in general. And there are so many tentacles that no one should ever examine any one super closely. Once I was happy with my white pink highlights, I used pure white and did a final highlight only on the most raised areas and spots I wanted to highlight, like the little mouths. The only thing left to work on is his face, his moneymaker, and I think I finally figured out how I'm going to make a Warhammer Fantasy Battles Beast of Nurgle fit into a modern 40k Death Guard army. So I have this old Nurgle beast, and what can I do with it? I don't collect Magakin of Nurgle for Age of Sigmar, and there's no Beast of Nurgle in the Death Guard Codex. So what can I do with this guy? 
Well, I think I can make him an excellent chaos spawn. The Death Guard are an awesome army with some of the best sculpts GameZershop has ever made, but their army lists are a bit inconsistent, with great made for Nurgle kits like the Plague Burst Crawler and the Fetid Bloat Drone. These look the part because they were designed for Nurgle and only Nurgle. But for the units available to Nurgle that come from the Chaos Space Marine line, like the Chaos Land Raider, Chaos Predator, and the Great Defy, they kind of exist in a very different design aesthetic, and the Chaos Spawn are no different. Are they cool? Hell yes they're cool! Do they look nurgle -y? Well, not particularly. These guys look lean, spiky, and fast, which is great for Korn, Slaanesh, and Zinch. But not so much for Nurgle. Nurgle is all about being slow, tanky, and a little sticky, and these guys just won't do. That is where this Slug Walrus Medusa comes in. He will make the perfect Chaos Spawn count as, particularly as spawns stand on the 50mm round base, which is a perfect fit for this guy. He might be on the small side, but he is surprisingly long. On his pretty little face, I mix some red and green and put this on his skin. And then I mix my orange with water and glaze this over his lips. I put blue on the inside of his mouth. Then I took some pink onto my brush and gave his lips some stripes to give it a worm-like texture. And then I used pure white to highlight this. I used yellow to brighten up his teeth, and boy does he look like a Rick and Morty character. Those eyes have held up really, really well. Just the old cloudy Zenithal looks great. But... I wonder if weird, creepy pupils would look even better. Remember how I talked about painting is an additive process? Well, I think I'm just gonna go ahead and paint one of those eyes, and if I don't like it, I'll fix it. I took a brush and carefully took some black paint and made a pupil. I started with a tiny dot and then made it bigger. Then I went in with some white paint on my brush and filled in the black with white. Yep, that was definitely the right choice. Pale, spooky eyes definitely looked cooler, but weird wall-eyed pupils looks hilarious and I love it. The only thing left to do was the base and for my death guard I just used whatever is left on my palette. I slobbed on some of my red brown, some green, some yellow, some blue and I let it all just mix together. A few swipes of the brush and this beast of Nurgle was ready to become a chaos spawn. Man what kind of a noise do you think this thing makes? It looks like it maybe like like a <sighs> Okay, time to paint the rim of the base black. What I love about having old models like this is that I feel like it comes with a certain amount of clout. I am probably one of the very small number of people with one of these models. Mine is almost certainly one of the best painted because it was painted today and not 30 years ago. And it is perhaps the last of its kind to see tabletop time. Not in a game of Warhammer Fantasy Battles, but in a modern game of Warhammer 40k. And it really jingles my spurs to have a living piece of Warhammer history. 